So, Chris, could you just, uh, on that slide, um, could you just explain what the different headings mean, the upper bound, and so on? So this is the high, high intake estimate. So um, the second cop, oh, it should say points of departures there, my fault. We've changed from reference doses to points of departures. It's still in micrograms per kilogram for body weight per day. And units there because that would match the, the um, exposure data. So the third column is the, the high intake estimates as calculated here, right. um, except is it only above a certain level? Above. So the last three, the last three values are just means. Mm -hmm. They don't reflect the 95th or the high end values. Okay, okay. We'll have to wait on those. In the fourth column are the biomonitoring, so those are from the NHANES 2005 and 6. They are the population average, I mean, population estimates for the 99th percentile. That's using the population weights, the sampling weights in NHANES. I, I had a question. Is that for women? For pregnant women, yeah. Uh, it's remarkably close. And then the, the last two columns are simply the ratios of what should be the points of departure there in the second column over the corresponding exposure columns. Um, the suggestion was to get rid of what I was trying to do with the folds higher and lower. What you see there is actually the calculation, but I think you should recognize that those numbers are too many. I don't think we should emphasize that many, you know, significant digits. We're not. We're trying to de-emphasize yeah, yeah. significant digits here, but at least it, it is the actual um, ratio. Um, so I think. Andres, if you want to pick up on what... Yeah, yeah. so, so normally you would demand, uh, since you're here, these, these comparisons are direct me, uh, comparisons between what, what, what was given in these animal studies to the animals and mm -hmm. what human exposures are. So for you, you would uh, expect a margin of exposure to be uh, between 100, anything between 100 and 1,000 maybe, depending on uh, the uncertainties behind it, the severity of the endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So what, uh, what this shows is, uh, you know, one, one thing sticks out, that's uh, DEHP, that there is a, this is a margin of exposure of around 10. Uh, that is definitely not good news. Mm -hmm. And so on. You know you can read the data yourself. The rest of them seem pretty. You're not concerned about the other ones above that. HP, that's... DVP. Which one? DVP. I would say even the DEP is actually interesting to me because I've been thinking that we know the exposure there is so high. But now those, that estimate for a point of departure is very rough. That was based on, what was that, for Phil? But it, it looks, it's interesting that the three banned chemicals, DBP, BBP, and DEHP, have the lower ones. Mm -hmm. And then it's like another order of magnitude up for the, the um, interim bands. Well, I don't know about the last three. I shouldn't look at those numbers, but. The DI, so those are actually based on, they haven't cal calculated the high intake estimate. So those. On the median. Well, on the on the modeling column, right, the last right. column, we could look at that. 
Yes. So DINP looks, you know, that's kind of that region where we might be worried. What's your worry factor? I mean, factor of 10 versus factor of 1,000 versus factor of 10,000. I'm not sure. I mean, factor of 10, yeah, I can see where's a worry factor. Factor of 1,000. Andreas, help me. Yeah, that, that's, that's sort of a, a matter for, for consideration. I mean, we can't do this in detail now. It would be, we would need more material for that. But uh, I, I'd say. Pregnant women. Yeah. That would be one. That would be that would be the gray area. So if we have hmm. worry, non-worry. This is the gray. That you'd call that the gray area. Yeah. Well, right. what what sticks out here is, as Chris said, that the uh, permanently banned uh, thalates. There seems to be seems to be a failure, a system failure, which shines through here very clearly. That's right. Very much so. Yeah. I and P looks and falls into that as well. Mm. Which one? The I and P. That's the one looking where we don't my, have. Looking at the last column. That's where we're only looking at the biomonitoring index. Of the other. Right. Okay. What I think is going to be very curious is that PNOP median or mean is similar to the high end biomonitoring. I'll be curious to see what that comes up with. That means either a very narrow distribution or there is a very large number sitting out there. Okay, yeah. 95th percentile. The other table, if you want to look at it, I don't know if it's interesting, is the median estimates. But with this now, you can do considerations along the following lines. Uh, for example, uh, Holger, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. DINP is proposed to substitute DEHP? Right. So, should that be the case, you can expect the exposures for DINP to go up. Probably, I don't know, I'm, that's speculation, but the concern would be that they then reach uh, reach the zone where you would become concerned about too small a margin of exposure. Whereas, for example, uh, that uh, it, these numbers would indicate that there's, there's little concern with the IDP at the moment. Mm -hmm. so that's the median. Maybe we should Let's, let's talk about the median, too, because this is very curious, because it only it basically shows there's only one. If you go by Andreas's initial differentiation, it's DHP, which is shows up as being a concern. And there's a very big difference between well, let's put it this way. There, is, there are much greater differences in terms of the margin of exposure between the modeling and the biomonitoring median, which could probably be due to the fact that, uh, again, how representative our median is of the total reality of what's out there, or is that still biased because we have to use exposure factors? And... Um, we have to, there's a little bit more uncertainty in those values. Mm. I don't know, it, we, we should probably, that's probably a point for, for our report to say that, uh, so maybe a call for the other uh, competent authorities here in the US looking at DEP to say, well, mm -hmm. Something should be done. I mean, this is something that I guess is beyond <coughs> the competency of, of CPSC. Um, right. Or, or the jurisdiction of CPSC. Yes. Yeah. DEHP. D -E -H -P. D -E -H -P. Uh, this, is, this is a number here for DEHP is more troubling than the high-end numbers. 
for any of them. Yeah, even even with media and exposures, the margin of, of uh, exposure is is, in, is is insufficient. Yeah, in fact, I would I would say that for the median, a number of less than ten thousand is a worry number. Dealing with the median value. HP is really an issue. Thousand is your worry number, then. Uh, but that was for the high end, ninety fifth percentile. We're now talking about the means. Yeah, I mean, I'm st I'm still there. Then, BBP gets close. Oh no, that's one hundred forty seven. No, it's one hundred forty seven thousand. It's 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 DEHP, which is a which is an issue. And rightly so, Andreas is saying that this is total exposure. Which um, requires some other agencies to start thinking about what the heck to do. But that that's the 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 three permanently banned. Mm -hmm. We we see the numbers here. Um, we now need to consider the interim band. Mm -hmm. The INP is the first but one. But for the three ban, we're still not going to change the recommendation. It's Holger, do you, what do you, the one that recommended the DINP go up onto the band? Category? Do you still feel that way? Feel that way? Doesn't seem to support it. I just brought it up for discussion. Maybe we can switch to the 95th percentile again. Okay, let's go back. Well, we we don't we don't know about our calculated val values. All you're dealing here is with N Haynes at this point. I'll explain it to you on the, the upper margin slide. Right now for. DINP, we have a margin of exposure looking at the biomonitoring data of 1,852. So that's one of the intermediate worries, not the. It's intermediate worry worries, but if we assume that uh, mm -hmm. DHP is totally replaced by DINP, mm -hmm. we would assume that the exposure to DINP will rise significantly because you would have to zero out 375 and put it down into the line for DINP. This, of course, would make the margin of uh, exposure considerably smaller for DNP <coughs> then. If you're seeing one-to-one -one equivalent in exactly. terms of replacement. But that's what we have to assume. Unless somebody says they're doing something else. But these are, these are the issues we have to take into account. Yeah, I, I, intend, I agree. I agree. So DINP is, is still in the woods. Or, play, or still on the playing field? Uh, two, for two reasons. In the morning, we again discussed concerning the hazard. Right. Yesterday's study clearly showed that the INP has to be regarded as reproductive toxicant and an endocrine disruptor. So hazard is clear. And uh, unlike here, where we have a factor of 10 in potency between DHP and DINP, the, the other studies or all studies suggest that there's only a factor of 2.5 mm -hmm. to 3.8 in potency. So we have to be aware that these point of departures are not the conservative ones. Mm -hmm. Want to have a table with both? Do we want to select the more conservative ones? Oh, can, can I suggest we, we use Bernie's criteria to consider DINP and go through it? One by one. So ad adversity, Let, shall we start with adversity? Uh, we have three, well, the, the reason why DINP was put into, into the interim ban, I think, uh, well, at least speaking from a European perspective, at that time, there were very few data available for DINP. That has changed substantially. We have three well-conducted uh, uh, animal studies for DINP, uh, two of them 
of a caliber uh, normally required for, for regulatory purposes because the numbers uh, uh, of animals per dose group are sufficiently high, and that's the uh, Boback study from Denmark and uh, what Rebecca Kluwell presented us yesterday. Uh, then the third one is uh, Hannah et al., but I think that's a smaller, smaller study. But uh, in, in all these studies, we, we do see an effect on, uh, on uh, AGD and the Cluel study at uh, postnatal day 14. The, um, there's no doubt the effects of DINP are, uh, uh, well, DINP is not as potent as some of the other phthalates, nevertheless. Uh, with the, the, with the, there's a common thread through, throughout all these three studies at sufficiently high doses, you see uh, uh, an effect on uh, landmarks of male sexual differentiation uh, rat, indicative of androgen insufficiency in fetal life. Well, what, what you see in the, the Bolberg study is increased multinucleate gonocytes and nipple retention at 600 milligrams per yeah. kilogram and above, yeah. and increased uh, testicular testosterone content. Yeah. AGD at 900 milligrams per kilogram, and in the Hanna study, it's decreased fetal testosterone at 500 milligrams per kilogram per day, and then effects on gene expression. And as I remember in the Kluwel study, which was presented yesterday, it was decreased testosterone expression, but I don't think they saw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was decreased, uh, well, they measured uh, testosterone levels. We yes. go back and I'll measure testosterone production, which is a, which is a difference. Yeah. 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 But there was, uh, t two hours after, uh, in the Cluel study, there was also an effect. Well, we can say that slide number. So they, thought they saw no effect on AGD. No, uh, in, the, in the shorter time point, no effect on AGD, but at postnatal day 14, there was. That is slide number. My reading glasses. <laughs> That's slide number 25. How are you? 16? At uh, 7,400 ppm. Okay. Okay. The, 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 all of these studies, especially Kluhl and, and Boback, are uh, extremely well conducted, very high standards. Uh, the outcome of both of them is comparable, considering that uh, one used the Vista rat, the other one uh, Spectoli. We're talking about effects uh, um, that indicate clear adversity. So, well, we've already covered also the um, sort of the quality standards, they're, they're, they're of good quality. We have the other criterion is fulfill, fulfilled. These effects were seen independently in several studies conducted in, in different laboratories. So these criteria are, are fulfilled. Um, adversity, relevance to the human, well, in the absence of anything uh, <coughs> To the contrary, the default position is always to assume relevance for the human, which in this case we should do. We have uh, three uh, sets of these criteria fulfilled, so adversity, relevance to the human, and their co high quality. Mm -hmm. Now we're <coughs> moving into the area of risk mm -hmm. assessment. and, and I think what we see here from these numbers that as exposures stand currently in the U.S., margin of exposure considerations would suggest uh, that the INP is currently not in the zone where the amber light begins to flicker. However, um, following what Holger said, I also would have the concern that since this is slated as a replacement for DEHP, 
the concern is then that this will change, exposure will go up, and we consequently will have a reduced margin of exposure. So for my, in my mind, that would be justification enough to say, let's make DINP um, permanent. Particularly, exposure could go up two <coughs> orders of magnitude. That becomes the placement for DEHP. Have <laughs> don't want to speculate without the product guys on, are on your side, are they? Huh? What do the product guys say? I don't know. I mean, there's there's a general trend. DEHP is going down. DINP production is going up, and it's reflected at least in the German expo biomonitoring data. Right. Um, whether it's a one to one, I mean, they're both general purpose plasticizers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the uses overlap might not be a hundred percent, and I don't know if it's a one to one. Plus, things are always ch changing. I mean, DINP. You know, there's also DPHP and DIDP might, well, DPHP I know is going up too, so um, it, uh, it's a complicated picture. Uh, if, if you say it can go up one to two orders of magnitude, if it goes up one order of magnitude, our margin of exposure now is already less than three orders of magnitude. True. Mm -hmm. That's, those are the kinds of broad <coughs> swipes we're trying to do at this stage, right? Mm -hmm. Andreas, would you be willing to write up a um, summary of what you just said about DINP? Okay. That's what we're having. Certainly. Do you, when do you want it? Now? <coughs> Tomorrow will be fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think it might be <clears throat> important for us to make some kind of a declaration in there whether our concern is strictly limited to the possibility that it will increase if something else is decreased. Yeah. Or another way of saying that is I think we have an obligation to say how close we are to concern right now if nothing changes. And then we become even more concerned if the levels go up because of more widespread use. I, I think it's important to find that information out because I'd hate to put something out and find out, you know, we're off base because of a new direction being taken by industry. It would be, uh, we would be kind of an embarrassing moment. But even so, I mean, the discussion about a margin of exposure of three orders of magnitude, when you're talking about pregnant women, I, I don't think we should be down in a margin of exposure or one or two orders of magnitude, I think three. So we're there now. We're in the we're in the gray region now. We're in from what from taking Andreas's criteria, we're in the gray area right now. Yeah. We're not in the you know, the the area of we, ultimate concern. Yeah, it's the gray area. We gotta be really careful. We we should clearly say that. And this, uh, like, like Bernie said, uh, I totally agree with what Bernie said. The, we should say it state very clearly that the concern is for this movement, this change in exposure, should, uh, should this be a replacement for, for DEHP. Well, that raises the question, would we recommend banning if we knew for sure the level wasn't going to increase? If it's going to increase by, for back, let's say we, let's make the, the ultimate assumption and use Holger's point, that the increase goes to the equivalent to 375. That pushes it over into what uh, Andrea says is the region of great concern, correct? 
great concern. I do not know. I wouldn't we'll want to qualify it like that. But, well, it, but it would be in the area of uh, an exposure factor around 10, 9 or 10. Would that raise your antennas up very high? That would raise my antennas up very high. Because then it would be in the DEHP right. range where we are concerned. Right. So, therefore, it depends upon whether or not this is truly, again, we need that other information to help us make it. <clears throat> make a wise decision. The other thing, Russ, today, this morning, um, we were talking and you said something about you are aware of some of the chemicals, that there are some really high levels based on medication use or whatever. So it might be interesting also for you to take a peek at the, at the uh, high exposure estimates here relative to what you know about oh, right. extreme values, because those extreme values may not be represented in this population study. As far as I know, the extreme values would be for the for the butyl. Uh, primarily, be, there are examples through medications where people have a thousandfold higher exposures. Butyl, dibutyl, phthalate. For DINP, I'm, I don't think it's used in that circumstance. Holger may know better, but I don't think it is. Um, DEP is. DEP. DEP in medication, is it? How about in, in medical products? Are they substituting DINP for DEHP to soften plastics? No, no. But it doesn't matter. Medical products are a totally different <clears throat> issue because the risk benefit <clears throat> issue is highly significant. I mean, you know, I don't want a metal pipe put down my stomach when, I'm, when I have a. Yeah, but it's also used for other purposes. But what I'm saying, though, and, and even if you're in dialysis, I mean, you're under criti critical care at that particular. Well, I think the, I think the risk. Donating blood or platelets. Yeah, but the, the risk benefit no issue benefit is, you. but to the person who's getting it, yeah. I think the risk benefit issues come into play when you're dealing with medical products, and we have to keep that out of the conversation for the time being. Um, but what about just a more general conversation about? Knowledge of things that more are more extreme than what's here. <coughs> Give me an example. This is just from a biomonitoring population study. If we are aware of studies that had, whether it's medication or other sources, I think we ought to take that into account here, just as. But I wouldn't want to make a decision on <coughs> DIMP based upon medical uses. It's not. It's not part of. The, I think the equation at this point in time. Different risk. Different risk issues. Another thing about what I think we should consider <clears throat> with each one of these reviews that we do and the recommendation that's within it is to make a statement of whether or not this regulatory action, if followed, would change the exposure of children. Then we're directly responsive to the charge. Mm -hmm. This would. So I think we should make the statement that we would expect this would have a, a significant decrease in risk to children because of a decrease in exposure to this phthalate. Is that a fair statement? We want to use then the biomonitoring estimates for infants for those kinds of statements. This is now, these are values for pregnant women. <coughs> the infants ends up being higher in some cases. My first thought, Chris, would be no, that, that information, we can have that back in the, in the text where we describe the information. But if we begin to put that up, bury them within this recommendation, then people are going to look to compare those numbers from one decision to another, and we're going to be held accountable for very small differences. And in fact, they may be less important than something else that is driving our recommendation. My first thought, but leave up to others. I may have misspoken. It looks like BBP is the one that has a higher infant value. The others are sort of about, sort of comparable, I would, I would say. Holger, are you comfortable that the biomonitoring data captures the DINP in terms of the metabolites that were measured and? In the studies, Chris and me, 
look that I am pretty confident that uh, by monitoring data captures the exposure to DINP because mm -hmm. exposure estimates were based on oxidized DINP metabolites, not the monoester. But I think this data is reliable. Although it is based on only one metabolite, in Germany and Europe we use three different oxidized metabolites, but it pretty much confirms the data. Have we finished discussion of DINP? Where are we with it? Well, we have uh, Andreas writing up a uh, summary for us, which you know we will revisit. Um, yeah. Is the is this in broad outline acceptable to the committee? Yeah. So the the in broad outline is this acceptable to the committee? This. Uh, consideration accordingly to the criteria. So the recommendation uh, in for DINP would be to make it per the to to suggest a permanent ban. Is that consensus? I have one question for Mike. Mike, you you did the DINP evaluation a couple of years ago, did you? And you modeled Oral exposure by sucking on the on on, on toys or something. Uh, the biomonitoring or daily intake we calculated here is it in the same region that you calculated in your model, or did you calculate higher daily in, higher higher intakes? Because in contrast to the time you studied the INF, we now have a point of departure. Yeah. Well, we estimated. Um, I think for teethers and toys on the order of a few micrograms per kilogram per day just from mouth. Um, of course, uh, at the time there wasn't any bio, any, well, the biomonitoring data was, were negative. Um, so, but it was probably, ina it was inadequate as well. So, um, you know, so the, you know, modeling levels, a microgram per kilogram per day, that's probably, I mean, I think we were definitely below 27, um, unless you're looking at, you know, upper bounds or something. Okay. Oh, if that's the 95th. Okay. Oh, it's, it's a median, it's a median on the modeling. Okay. For DIN. In the 95th on the biomonitoring. Well, that, that would fit in with what we had for the children. For just mouthing. Yeah. Mouthing of what? Uh, mouthing teethers and toys. Okay. For which age group? Well, for, I mean, we did up to th 36 months, you know, by year. Um, but that, you know, roughly uh, to an order of magnitude without looking it up, it was, you know, a few micrograms per kilogram per day. Yeah. And the upper bounds, you know, I just might be around 27, something like that. So we'll know more when uh, Thursday. Confirm it. Versa sees the oral route or the... the ingestion route as the major route of uptake to DINP. Do I have the right? Is it right? Let me confirm that to you. That would be soil dust, cosmetics as, as in lipsticks.
I can't see it right. Could you go back? Yeah, D I N B the bottom yeah, left. It's, it's indirect ingestion. It's not food. Food, food in the model because you had only limited okay. data. Or is it it's a fraction in there because you had negative data? No, these are the numbers where we looked at uh, the ones that did not we did not include concentrations in this. Yeah, yeah, but uh, actually, I can maybe go back to the spreadsheets. It might be. Let's, I think what we should do is keep these on concentration numbers. Okay, so let's look at ingestion food, and we can look at DINP. Don't have DINP here. Don't have data. Therefore, it falls out of the equation. Therefore, it is an unknown factor. If we assume that DIDP replaces DEHP, we would have to assume that something would add up on the direct ingestion route, that is foodstuff. Point that out. The thing is we got large uncertainty. Exactly. So I would assume based... I think based on 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 you on the Versa data, I would expect that they compared to the biomonitoring data underestimate the exposure because you don't have any data on DINP in foodstuff. I agree. Well, let's see what happens though. But I, agree. but I would I would expect an underestimation for a DINP. Okay. What what was the reason again? Because you don't have the data. Because we know from fasting studies, for example, human biomonitoring data, that uh, DINP, the major source of exposure, is contaminated foodstuff, like, for example, with DEHP. No, I mean, the food data that we have are, is, is old and it might not have there's, DINP. There's no food data. There is no food data. Yeah. yeah. Which is one of, one of the things we need to consider in the modeling is. Uh, I, I mean, I made a matrix of, you know, these are the scenarios and these are the phthalates where there's data. And, you know, if you don't see DINP in food, you have to say, you know, ask. Are, these are older studies where they even looking for it, and they probably weren't. Yeah, but I think if we're going to use it in our analysis, we have to put an asterisk next to it and say, void of this data. Therefore, there's one well, more exposure. Yeah, yeah. Is, well, that's... Is, 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 is not available for true yeah. comparison with the biomonitoring data. And so therefore, if it's low, it can be artificially low. If it's high, well, then it's even a different story, saying yeah. that there is another, there are other routes of exposure there where there is data that one is con should be concerned about. Well, yeah, it's, it's exactly why I did that. I was looking for where, you know, is it low because it's low, or is it low because there's a gap in the data? it might be the appropriate time to comment on what we're doing or what it sounds like we're doing. Because some of us in the room and some listeners may decide that CHAP decided this afternoon to recommend banning DINP. Right. And I don't think that would be the right conclusion. No. We are discussing data on example chemicals, but we're also shaking down the system. We may decide after three or four of these that we want to take a slightly different approach, in which case we, we, help, we helped ourselves by exploring the system that we're about to use with 
live examples, so to speak. But I would sure not want to see in the newspaper that CHAP decided to recommend that the ANP should be banned. Because we're, we're not voting. No. We're going through an exercise, and we're seeing how well this system fits that we've been working on for some months. Is that fair, Mike? Uh, absolutely, and I wouldn't want anyone to, in the audience to, to get the imp impression that this is the final answer. And, you know, I, in the last chap, there were certain issues like is this mechanism relevant to humans and that, that they would have these, like, straw. They kept voting, and if they kept coming back and voting again, and, you know, it would change up and down, and, you know, it's not final till it's final. I think it's more fundamental than that. I think that Bart's right. We're discussing the framework for coming up to decision and looking at the variables and the information we have available to us to make the decision and also some of the variables that we want to consider in making the decision. So the discussion to today is purely, you know, a group of um, scientists, others, sitting around trying to decide how we were going to approach finalization of the problem rather than even deliberating about an individual chemical present time. Yeah, but I, I still want to emphasize that I think it's important, Andreas, that you capture yes. you know, this in, in writing so that when we come back again, we don't go back to square one, that we say this is what we talked about, and do we have agreement on that or not? Mm -hmm. Do we want to modify it or not? Because eventually, and sooner rather than later, we are going to have to vote up or down. So. Can I add to this? I, I, I totally agree with everything that's been said before. Um, the problem I think we are facing is this, um, that we have to, probably for the first time on this topic, have to develop and come up with a set of criteria that is, that is plausible and transparent. And this has not been done before in the way that's been handled in Europe and so far here in the US as well, was on the basis of criteria that, uh, well, to put it politely, were opaque. So we are now, for the very first time, a group for, uh, that, that has to face up to this and uh, uh, develop, first of all, a set of plausible criteria and then apply them. And that's what we are, well, I wholeheartedly agree. That is what we are tentatively trying to do this afternoon, and uh, this is by no means a final decision. But we are playing, we are trying out a set of criteria that uh, Bernie has developed and, and see how f where that gets us. No more, but no less. And along those lines, the issue of the different routes, the different sources, are still all up for grabs because we still need to consider more calculations and the fact that we have not dealt with the transfer between the mother and the child issue either, I think effectively. We're just looking now at the mother, we're going to be looking at the children, there's going to be a crossover at some point where some of the phthalates could go from in utero from mother to child and even after the child's born, and we have to consider all those things too. So we have a lot of work in terms of assembling information to do, not the fact that we're at a point where we don't know pretty much where we're heading, but coming up with the different routes of exposure is going to be an interesting process of elimination. Because even though we have inhalation, we have dermal, whatever, we still don't have that transfer between mother and fetus or mother and child, which I think is going to be an interesting set of discussions. Keep in mind that you know this report needs to be finalized in very short order. So if we're going to take into account what you just said, we need to have that finalized fairly soon. And that's why I, I said it because I don't want us to do any more analyses on adults besides women of childbearing AIDS, if we're going to do any additional analyses, it will be, I assume, on 
the transfer of of phthalates between mother and fetus in utero or mother and child after gestation, meaning breastfeeding and things of that sort. That's where I think we should spend our time because I think that's the only place we're going to get any real new information that can help make a decision. I could just, maybe you guys don't want to talk about this at this point, but I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about sort of the approach that we're talking about here. I mean, this isn't the only approach we're going to use. We're going to look at other things as well, like the hazard index and things like that. But in terms of the points of departures, these are largely based on NOELs. They are based on NOELs. If I had my choice, I'd much rather see the points of departures being you know, lower confidence intervals on a benchmark dose. Um, willing to assume that a lower confidence interval on a benchmark dose could be an order of magnitude lower. Mm. No well, I mean the, the no L's are not not the the best way of having a point of departure. It is what we have here. Um, so if we're starting to add up things like um, how many orders of magnitude are you know are important pregnancy um, species extrapolation. I would even want to include something about variation in the estimate of the points of departure. So I think we could easily get to three orders of magnitude that would be a, you know, other yeah. pieces there that should add another order mm. of magnitude. I, I, would, I would agree with you. I mean, these numbers, the in, important at this stage are the principles, not, not the precise numbers. And I would, uh, you know, considering uh, the harsh critique that is uh, leveled at, uh, at no else, uh, I would also prefer benchmarks, lower confidence, yeah, sure, as far as we, um, as, as far as that is possible. But this is a detail. I mean, important are the principles now. Question for both of you. Um, does it matter which one you use? Will the relative differences be the same? No, the, the benchmark procedure has, a, has an advantage. Uh, with NOELs, poor data quality is rewarded by having a higher NOEL. With benchmark, lower confidence uh, uh, limit, uh, poor data quality is uh, Give, gives you a lower estimate. So okay. that's, that's why the advocates of the benchmark approach emphasize that. And uh, there are very, various other problems with no else. Okay. So right. they're too dependent on the experimental design. They're really not fixed numbers, although they're always treated as if they were, et cetera, et cetera. So but we are, we, I mean, we do have part of our criterion that you're writing about as far as quality of the studies and things. So it, hopefully, the, you know, we would have a quality study so that the, vari the variability would be, but it's still the choice of the doses may not have been done based on trying to find a point of departure. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of the studies that, that I reviewed were done in a way that, that designed to develop a, or to come up with a benchmark dose. Really? No. Okay. O only one for DHP. Yes. Possibly. I don't know. I mean, the, we, that leads too far for this afternoon. I mean, this is a detail. We need to look at it. Uh, if possible, we should use it. If not, then the reason I'm thinking, we stick with no else. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's, it's, a, it's minutia. But the reason I was thinking about that one, thinking of how many orders of magnitude really should we be comparing? Should it be two, three, four? Then it made me think about, well, I think there ought to be at least an order of magnitude because of that distinction. Other factors that may provide other... I don't see that being necessary. Okay. Yeah, let's go back up to the, uh, to the top. Um, well, the top two, DMP and DEP. Um, <clears throat> the no wells for those, uh, both of those, the, the developmental talk studies are, there isn't much information. What's there? Um, they weren't really designed uh, to determine no well, but the studies showed no effects, basically, uh, but didn't determine a no well. We, we took the, the dose, 750 milligrams per kilogram, um, we plugged in as a no well. 
arbitrarily. Uh, but at, at that dose, for both of those, there basically isn't any effect. Now, DEP, given the exposure, has a much different margin of exposure number than does DMP. Would say the the quality of of this point of departure that's gone into that is is also rather poor. Or poor. What what? Just to remind us, what were the endpoints that's based on? There weren't any. There, was a null spot. Uh -huh. there were no effects. I'd say roll over. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. <laughs> so, but again, what what do we do with the, the DEP, where there's, it's a high exposure phthalate in humans? I think there's some correlations. D in the Swan paper. Mm-hmm. The kind of situation where we need more data, and so we have to, we put it in a situation where we're trying to push those kinds of studies to come around. It is a high exposure data. Important to have that point of departure nailed down. This may be very conservative. And again, the the, the, the animal data. We don't really know. Russ, Russ how, how would you interpret the epidemiology there? The Ormond paper is very difficult to say what was going on there, what hairdressers are exposed to precisely, we don't know. <clears throat> Probably a mixture of DBP and DEP, I guess. I have no idea. We have uh, the, the SWAN data where <coughs> DEP metabolites were very high in the urine, and uh, she aggregated by simply adding up and uh, then found associations with AGD index. With, uh, and, and with MEP alone. With so MEP alone. alone as well as the aggregate right. exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that's, you know, it's, it's um, you know, a single study, about 100 infants with prenatal um, exposures measured in the mother's urine. The yeah. <clears throat> occupational studies you're referring to are, um, you know, inc I've, I've included them, but they don't have specific biomarkers of exposure, right. plus yeah. there's confounding by yeah. co-exposures. That's right. That's right. And the follow-up studies, one at all? Which one? The, the um, we're talking about the 2005 study, Swan et al., and then I oh, think 2008 the follow-up. Yeah, they were they were consistent. You know, basically, I think the 2005 I can look at. I think 85 infants in 2008 had 100, maybe 105. So it wasn't tremendously larger. Um, and, and remind us what's the relation precisely between the original study and the follow-up? Were the follow-up new? Uh, individuals they, included? Yeah, they added additional in, in, uh, infants. So would you therefore think... But it's think the same cohort, same yeah. exposure metric, same timing of exposure, same way in which they measured outcome. So it's I guess this doesn't uh, really fully qualify <clears throat> as, a, as a new independently reproduced study, but would you, how would you say how far... I described we? it as basically a second analysis from the same study. Right. It's not completely independent, is yeah. what you're getting at, yeah. And Russ, how much, well, okay, I mean, I know, I read your your text. I think there's no doubt that stuff like that needs to be reproduced, but uh, how much weight can we put on it now? I'd say some. <laughs> Some weight. I don't. How much further to. 
Okay, then shall we apply I, uh, our <coughs> systematic criteria and see I, how it plays out? Well, I wouldn't ignore it, basically, so I would give it some weight. Yeah, but I, I agree with Andrea. We should see how it fits with the criteria. If, it, if it's got some weight, yeah. does it have little weight, medium, or high weight? That you have to have some degree of confidence. That means your confidence low, medium, or high? Medium. medium. <laughs> the worst possible, of course. As a true epidemiologist, we need more studies. <laughs> Bern, you had a comment? Yeah, just to <clears throat> fill out the three sides here for the MP regarding reproductive data <clears throat> in humans and animals. There were no studies available for review on DMP in humans. And for animal data, there were no single or multiple generation reproductive studies in animals that were available for review. So essentially, there were no studies for DMP. DMP. Mm -hmm. And for DEP, there are well-designed, at least one well-designed reproductive study. There are some studies in humans. But there was an NTP, continuous breeding study, in mice, in which the dose levels were different from males to females, but about 500, 2,500 and 4,500 milligrams per kilogram per day. And the Noel for females was 4,800 milligrams per kilogram per day. There were adverse effects reproductive effects, but not resembling these phthalate syndrome. And the, the noel in the weanlings was about 250 to 270 milligrams per kilogram per day, primarily a body weight effect. And the noel for adult female rats in that reproductive study, about 250 to 270 milligrams per kilogram per day. No male reproductive effects? There were. There was a decrease in sperm count and sperm quality. What level? Was there no, was there no well for that? highest dose level, about 4,500 milligrams per kilogram per day. Is it clear um, in any way by what mechanism, or is this totally indeterminate? Determinate, right. <clears throat> that wasn't part of the study. Okay. But, okay, then, look, if we apply those criteria, adversity first, I mean, these effects you're describing, <coughs> would we cluster them as adverse? Are you doing both of these chemicals at the same time or one at a time? I think DMP is falling by the wayside. Let's, shall we focus on DEP? May I suggest that we focus on DEP, but then come yeah. back to DMP with the idea of the World Health Organization saying, first year we can make some kind of assumptions about a reference dose even very I mean you know to get us because I would suggest that we take DMP to completion okay so right. that it forces us with the system to deal with the chemical for which there are no data mm -hmm. and decide what statement we're going to make when there are no data to, to determine risk I think that we should, I think we should try to come up with a conservative estimate for a reference dose. Is that even possible? Well, that, and that's what we did. I mean, we, I don't know if that's conservative, but we, we chose the. So are there similarities between DEP and DMP that would connect us to say whatever DEP has, DMP we would use there as well, a filler? The ones I'm testing, the other stuff. Yeah. Structurally, though, are there con oh. comparisons that you'd put them together? I think it's important to, to keep in mind, too, the 
biomonitoring data between the two. I mean, there's extremely large difference right. human exposure. So apart from the hazard side, usually you know, barely, fairly not detectable, right? I mean, generally D or M, MP. The fact that DEP and DMP lowest molecular weight phthalates, would you expect there to be a similar reason to group them based on the backbone thing that you've identified? Toxicity? Yeah. The backbone thing? Yeah. I, yeah. I would think so, but I, I don't, I've never seen data suggesting that the same way it's been done with the C4 to C6. Is, is there any data that would give give uh, reason for concern? Any hints? I can't detect anything. From what I hear you're saying, there is no... Well, just that DEP causes reproductive effects in adult mice. No, sorry, no, we're for talking M, for DMP, for methyl. Methyl. Oh, DMP DMP. We don't, don't have any data. So, no. Are you saying that both based on the RFD or point of departure and the exposure? No, no, I think we need to separate this out. The RFD is, a, is guesswork, but yeah. first we need to see is there any evidence uh, quite independent from quantitating uh, potency in terms of an RFD or, or whatever. Is there any hint, any evidence in the literature that would make us uh, getting slightly concerned about DMP? I can't detect anything. No developmental tox. No Mainly because it wasn't tested. Is that correct? Well, it was tested, but it found no effects. Okay, then. No, that's, that's, that's different. Yeah. So the cri first criterion, adversity, is, is uh, clearly not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. That has an impact on the second criteria on uh, human relevance. Well, <laughs> no case to answer. Apply. Yeah, mm -hmm. doesn't apply. Relevance is that there is minor exposure. Yeah. Than that exposure. Yeah. So no, no further, no further action flows from this. So my, my concern about this way of thinking, though, is then it seems like that these are the kinds of situations that, that sort of push people not to continue to study some of these chemicals. I think I'd rather have it the other <coughs> way around where the burden is on. In this case, I'm not so worried because the exposure is so low, but if the exposure jumped up to levels of DEP. But there is some, some data, right? I mean, but it didn't show any effect. It's not like there's well, zero. Yeah, there's then the next question would be, according to uh, Chris, I'm just following on from what you said a couple of minutes ago, the next question then would be, okay, if we have uh, poor data or very little data and they don't show much, is there anything in the chemical structure that would make us conclude, aha, it looks slightly similar to one where we have more data and we, where we are concerned? But I can't see that uh, fulfilled either. Holger, would you agree? <clears throat> no, I wouldn't. What a statement of this kind for a chemical where we have one study, but it's an adequate study, that generally falls below the threshold for making a risk decision. Because generally, you like to see at least the teratology studies, the developmental tox studies, in a rodent and a non rodent tradition since the 1950s. So I would call this a marginal database that does not show any hazard. So it acknowledges that there are data, but it's, it's marginal, being only one study not replicated anyplace else. So 
Well, that's better than no data. We shouldn't discredit that. But it's still a little below the threshold for being able to say with more confidence that it's been studied in more than one species, perhaps more yep. than one site, and the results are negative. Yep. That's the case here. One dose, one study. Worse. Mm -hmm. One dose. Yep. It may be easy to pick one dose of anything and show that it, you can show thalidomide is okay. No. By, by picking one low dose. No, it, what it, but it is a dose that with other phthalates, it's clearly yeah, okay. toxic. Marginal study. Would you, would you uh, want to say on the basis of that we need more data for DMP? Is there reason to say more testing required? We, we can't say that because we don't have any authority to require anything. But we could say that more data would be needed to, fully, to more fully characterize the hazard that this might represent. Yes. But that's different from saying, for example, uh, there are hints, we, there are marginal concerns, and it would be good to have more data. You see, you see my point. Right, We're right, not right. in this ballpark with DMP. Right, but I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't use my word marginal to relate to anything other than the, the data that are available. The amount of data available to determine hazard is below the threshold. In, in this case, if, if you expose rats to DEHP, DBP, BBP, DINP to the dose that they exposed DMP, you would have had the full effect of that rat phthalate syndrome. So, so in that case, your, your concern is, is diminished. Yeah. It shows it's not a DEHP. And it was done in a, in a study in which... They also expose rats to DEHP at 750 milligrams per kilogram per day. Positive control. Yes. Well, it was a reasonable screen, but it's not a definitive study. Right. my concern would not be particularly high. So the tentative conclusion for DMP would therefore be uh, no further uh, no further proposals. Not an, not an interim ban, nothing. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. Tentatively? No action at this time. My concern is that then that means when there's no data, then that's the good thing. In in this case, there there are data. Limited data. I mean, I, you know. Well, but there's limited data in the context. Mm -hmm. But I think we should keep keep in mind what what Bernie said, in that this is an exercise, and we're not. Yeah voting or making a final decision yet. So when we get to some of the other chemicals for which there really is no data to kind of see how we handle that and then we may come back and revisit methyl or, or not. But this isn't, isn't our final. It's more of a kind of an exercise to but, see. But Chris is right. I mean, just because there's no data and, and doesn't let people off the hook. And Bern and I will put together a, a recommendation for this one and DEP as well. Yeah. For, for further consideration. The question is, what can you recommend with no data? Well, I, I'm, I'm going, I'm trying to get to the, the I think the thrust of, of Chris's argument is that no data is better. Well, this, this is an opportunity for us to make a statement about the absence of data. Mm -hmm. Even though we're not going to recommend interim ban or ban, mm -hmm. it is a. I, I really do hate to give the message that it's 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 okay. probably a good choice to not have data because yeah. they don't say anything. Right. So, I agree with Chris fully that we shouldn't pass up the opportunity to make a statement that risk can't be judged 
with the small amount of data available on this council. What do we recommend? Because there's got to be, you know, otherwise, you know, it's pie in the sky. It's like godmother and apple and pie. Yeah, you well, no, recommendation. But, but it, what are you going to say? It's, it's still a damning statement to point out that there aren't enough data to make a risk judgment or to even know what the hazard is. Well, it's a criticism of the people who own this chemical. It's a criticism, but I don't know if it's damning. Okay, it's, it's a crit criticism of, of the sponsor of this chemical. Or it's a criticism of the system for of not requiring. System. Yes. I would say it's more of a criticism of the system because you know, we're going back to Tosca then. You know, look at industrial chemicals. Yeah. And we're looking at chemicals being used in consumer products, which is the great black hole. Why nanoparticles is such a mess. I think the phthalate industry in general would be well served if more of the chemicals to which people were exposed had data behind them. I agree. And this is an opportunity for them to leave a message saying that. Yeah. <coughs> so we can do that one by one or we can make it in a more general statement. But every time one of these is identified as enough of a concern that it's banned, it's a signal to the world that somebody didn't do their homework. Mm -hmm. They should have anticipated that absence of an adequate database to protect human health, and they, they could have done something about it, so, they, but they haven't. All right, so th the issue becomes this, then, that the absence of data doesn't make you absolve yourself of the issue, but the question becomes is when is sufficient now data to say no further action is necessary on this chemical because it's not going to be a significant health concern. I mean, those, those are issues we have to grapple with on all counts because bans, interim bans, and no further action should be our three criteria. Yeah. Yeah, our three, our three recommendations, you mean? Yeah, our three recommendations. I'm sorry, three recommendations. I agree with you. Sorry, Philip. Well, for me, the, the threshold is two teratology studies, two developmental tox studies preferably in two different species, a rodent and a non-rodent, and both well-designed with adequate statistical power to be able to, defect, to detect an effect and to not have confounders that would mask an effect. So that's, that's my threshold. Okay, that's fair, it's good. I guess I could put that in the commentary on my piece mm -hmm. for the report. That fit with Andreas's book. I couldn't agree more. You guys are the experts no. in this, and I'm, you know, I'm just a. But I just comment. But I just made a comment on my threshold for Phil's part. <laughs> <laughs> the threshold for the reproductive studies is different. Right. Because you never ask for a reproductive study in a, in a non, rodent. Yeah. Yet. But so the thresh, there is a threshold in each area just like there's a threshold in the epidemiology area, and maybe that's something that we need to comment on in each of our three sections. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue that I grappled with in, in my section because uh, there are a lot of, a lot of studies uh, relating to phthalates and, and in utero exposures, but many of them were not designed to do to provide data that that Byrne would consider adequate, mm -hmm. they simply weren't. So, if we want to generate the kind of data that Chris needs, um, you know, many times we just wouldn't have it if we used Byrne's criteria. So, let me throw it into my ballpark as well as. Holger's ballpark. What do we consider as de minimis exposures? That beyond which there's no reason to think about in terms of either biomonitoring numbers or in terms of calculated values. 
for any one or a number of routes of entry into the body. Clearly, this question can't be answered without any information about the potency of the chemical in question. Well, actually, sure, it has to have both those parts to it. If it doesn't, yeah. then it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a futile mm -hmm. exercise. But yeah. I think both of them have to be put together. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. an extremely low exposure. Is it a de minimis risk? Is what the issue finally without resolves any itself? Yeah, without any information about potency, you don't know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Totally agree. DEP. Yeah, well, let Byrne and I will put together a recommendation for DEP and DMP, mm -hmm. and then at our next mm -hmm. session, we will discuss those okay. and modify, change. But, but have we discussed DEP to the end? No, we can, okay. we can, we can do that. So DEP is, as I said, in the same, same boat, um, same group. Did the same study, one dose, one study, no effects. But but in uh, contrast to DMP, we have now, although imperfect, but some hints, indications from epidemiology. That really distinguishes DEP from DMP. Yes, and and the exposure, I'd say too. Yeah, and the exposure yeah. differences. Yeah. Thousand-fold difference. So. so the human uh, evidence would uh, raise concerns about adversity. Would you agree? Would raise concerns. It does not prove adversity, but it raises some concerns. Yes, and and not just. I mean, the the endpoint was AGD, but in mm. the report or or maybe in that smaller front section. Some recent studies in the last year showing associations between AGD and semen quality in adult men, infertility, and hypospadias. You know, it wasn't in the SWAN study, but basically supporting potentially that AGD is a surrogate for other developmental effects in the reproductive tract or fertility measures later in life. So the, there are three studies that were, you know, they're done on a different population. They were just looking at, do, ch do boys with hypospadias have shorter AGD? Yes. Do men in an infertility clinic or, or men with infertility have shorter AGD than men mm. with proven fertility? Yes. And um, is there a relationship with semen quality? And yes. So, so I think that that adds more to it than just this is an anatomical marker that, that it is associated with, um, with function and development. But then clearly the looking at the weight of evidence data, quality of studies, et cetera, et cetera, here we have also short faults. So it's mm -hmm. only, only one, uh, one or two observations. Um, and I think according to Bernie's criteria this morning, that would fall short mm -hmm. of a recommendation for a permanent ban, but the question is, would it qualify for recommending an interim ban until further data are available that prove? Margin of exposure is just about three orders of magnitude. I have a problem with this one because I, I'm on the fence. Oh, there's only one. There's, there's only one human study, right? So how I just can't ban on that reason. Well, it's it's something we need to yeah, feel ourselves to, into. You know, we're yes, playing here with we're 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 thinking aloud more. I, I, agree. I agree. I'm also unsure about it. I don't <clears> know. I'm so based on based on the red studies and the phthalate syndrome in rats and. Uh, backbone chain length paradigm in rats that says uh, backbone chain lengths from three carbons, that's the isobutyl phthalate, to six carbons, that's the DHP. Now I would say it could go from a three to seven, including DINP. We have the hotspot of activity. So from these studies, I'm rethinking here, we would expect that DEP 
if at all, would be very, very, very weak. On the other hand, of course, if we see that the exposure is very, very high, that would kind of level it out. We have no real proven tox data to, to weight. weight the exposure in terms of risk or related to the hazard. We have the human data and we have some indication that at very high doses we might see some effects that remind us of the effects that uh, can be observed in the Fidelity syndrome. I'm just citing from what you wrote down from the NTP report. <coughs> high doses, DEP, F1 parental males had 32% increased prostate weight, 30% decreased sperm concentration, increased rates of abnormal sperms. So at very high concentrations, we might expect to see some effects indicating into this direction, which would again, which would again fit into the picture of, well, we are on the tail end of the <coughs> potency of the phthalates. <coughs> and we heard yesterday that maybe the backbone paradigm might not be applicable in total to the humans. That, that's a question, yeah. It's a question again. Leaning me more and more toward not wanting action at this point. More, I couldn't stand weight of evidence, and I don't think there's enough weight to be. Able to. But again, this is all we're all speculating at this point. In time. But this is good. This is good conversation because. There's going to be others which are obvious. I give you a little more information on the reproductive studies because there is a second study beyond the NTP study, and it's one reported by Fuji. And it's a two generation reproductive study in rats given in amounts to provide one, over 1,000 and 1,400 milligrams per kilogram per day, and they saw nothing. Study by the NTP, dose, lane, dose levels ranging from 250 mm -hmm. to 4,500 milligrams per kilogram per day, where they saw the things that are consistent with what were reported in humans. That was in mice. And then study in rats, reasonably well designed. It's a 2005 study, it's not a 1946 study. Saw nothing. Their, their highest dose didn't reach the highest. No, that's right. But still, it's lower. I mean, yeah. fits with Holger's argument. Should that should we change our? Lack of information on that. Be a point of departure okay, from the NTP study at grams per kilogram per day, Noel. That would be lower than this. Right. Oh. We can talk about identifying a point of departure for that. So, what we're talking about, going back to the criteria, I, I'm very uncomfortable trying to manipulate. I guess we don't have enough data to make a decision. I guess, Paul, what I'm, I'm not at that question yet. I'm still back at the question is, is for reproductive effects, is there a threshold of data here? And because there are two multi-generation reproductive studies in two different species, there probably is a threshold of reproductive data here. 
But that doesn't answer the question of the phthalate syndrome right. in the developmental park study. Okay. And the existence of the human data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the very high exposure. Yeah. Very high exposure. And I also might point out that in the Fuji study, they say they observed decreased serum testosterone levels and increased tailless burns, but they did, did not consider it as significant. So again, this is just free thinking allowed, a hint that we might be at the lower end, end of, of the, the activity. Yeah. Well, I hope that, you know, if we write this up, we take the information from Russ's part, we take information from Chris and Holger's part on terms of exposure, and we take part from the repro from the developmental and put it together into a document that we can share with everyone and then we go over this again mm -hmm. then I think we have it all in front of us and we can say okay there's this is what we have what are we going to do with it right. I, it's helpful for, to me to have something in black and white in front of me to rather than just hearing tidbits from different people that I can't assimilate and keep my weak brain <clears throat> Well, for DMP, we can write the complete paragraph. But for DEP, I think we need to figure out where do we where do we come down on this as a as a path? Yeah. Because it, this is worse than no data, because we have a lot of exposure and we have a report we have information in animals and humans. Yeah. But it's the question is: Is it enough to recommend a regulatory action? Right. Other than leave it alone. And identify that this this one is a close call. And this is one where we may need more data and more sophisticated studies. Yeah. To turn. Yeah. Uh, my feeling is right now, now it's leading to me to say we need more sophisticated studies to truly reduce the uncertainty and maybe find Hulger's point of, you know, where in fact the, the toxicity yeah, does start. We can, make, we can make a statement of that kind. I okay, think that's a reasonable way to think about it. This this one's very interesting. So DIBP, BBP, DBP, DHP. Oh, DIBP is on the interim, right? No. No. Where is it? Europe isn't, is it? Yes. It, it's included, right? No, it's not included, but it is labeled uh, a reproductic uh, agent category two, and therefore it is forbidden in cosmetics. That's what I thought. But it's okay. not on the interim yeah, ban. Okay. Uh, GIBP okay. is not on. Lip through because it's an isoform, mm -hmm. which was not taken into account. They've made a statement about its hazard, but they haven't yeah. officially labeled. 2000, since 2009. Right. So the DBP and BBP and DHP <coughs> were, were, were finished, right? Pardon me? <coughs> the banned ones were finished. Yeah. Uh, so the interim ban, um, DNLP, that one next. Yeah, we unfortunately we can't, we don't have the high exposure modeling intake yet, folks, for the last three. <clears throat> How soon is soon? Monday. Monday. Help us today. We're trying to figure out what we can do yet this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Otherwise, we won't be together again for another month. What about noon tomorrow? Late. Okay, I'll try to have something by tomorrow morning. Be good. Okay, all right. So that's that's true for all the last three, correct? Yeah, the yeah. last three are in the same category. We have the median, 
estimates, but we don't have the high exposure modeling estimates, correct? Yes, the only one remaining then is DIBP. DIBP. That one has no exposure. Where there's very low exposure. And DIBP. In the Swan study, there was an association with shortened AGD with MIBP. That's the metabolite the they metabolite. measured in the okay. urine. So it's the DIBP. It's the, it's the intermediate. So it's the DIBP. Okay, yeah. fine. All right. All these, new, all these acronyms no, get I'm me not. a little confused after a while. GD is the same SWAN paper that the MEP. So should we start with the hazard for DIBP? What are the experimental data like? DIDP. Okay. Um, DIDP. DIBP, right? Oh, the third. Oh, sorry. DIBP. Yeah. Okay. Because DIBP. Uh, there are two studies by Salem Fade. One in 2006 was a, was a really big study, exposed on gestation day 6 through 20, and um, they saw um, increase in male fetuses with undescended testes at 500 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, Another study in 2008, somewhat smaller study, reduced male AGD on postnatal day one, increased nipple retention. Those are at 250 milligrams per kilogram per day. Also delayed onset of puberty and increased hypospadias, undescended testes, and that was at 500 milligrams per kilogram per day. So those were the two studies that really uh, we're of sufficient magnitude to determine a, a no well. No well. And um, based on the more conservative of the, of the two studies, um, a no well was chosen of 125 milligrams per kilogram per day. And there were, you know, there were other studies that, that weren't of what we would call sufficient um, magnitude, but found basically the same effects at the same similar concentration or doses. Um, I feel pretty confident in that no well is in, the, is in the ballpark for the developmental talks. So we have good quality studies or reasonable quality? Reasonable quality, yes. Adversity uh, is a concern? Yes. Relevance to humans, criteria unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. that, where would that, that leave you, Bernie? For reproductive studies on DIBP, <clears throat> there are no animal studies that are multi, that either are single generation mm -hmm. or multi-generation reproductive studies. So there are non-generational studies where animals were looked at histologically for adverse effects on the testis, but no, no reproductive, no generation data. Do had a study looking for testicular effects in male adolescent rats given DIBP for up to seven days at dose levels ranging from 100 to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram per day. And there was a significant increase in testis weights, increase in apoptotic, apoptotic 
spermatogenic cells disorganization or reduced by mentum filaments in Sertoli cells at dose levels of 500 and higher. So their no effect level here would be 300 milligrams per kilogram per day in this non-reproductive study. Then there was another, and that's a study that's reported in 2010. The other study was one reported by Hodge in 1954, and it was the effects of DIBP in a four-month subchronic study in rats. And the dose levels were 67, 738, or 5,960 5, milligrams per kilogram per day. Absolute and relative testis weights were significantly decreased at the high dose level, so the NOAL was 738 milligrams per kilogram per day. Testis weight fluctuates with changes in body weight. So it's very, in a study of that, in 1954, rats were not very homogeneous. Very difficult to say, to rule out that a chemical that's given in high dose, body dose mm -hmm. amounts Toxicity is generally like decreased weight gain in a four-month study. That wouldn't be uncommon to find a change in uh, in testis weight mm -hmm. that was not reflected in a would not be reflected in a reflected as nothing in a reproductive study. Okay. So it it's a signal. It's data on the right organ, but it's not very definitive information study by zoo would be more definitive. So I think the answer here is there are there are no reproductive studies. There are two other studies where authors looked at the testis as part of another study. Any epi? Yes, the uh the, the Swan paper? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The MIBP, yeah. Plus we have the Hannas et al study. 2011 from uh, Grace Group, determining the relative potency factors for several phthalates on fetal testis endpoints, including testosterone reduction and testicular gene expression. And they found that uh, DIBP reduced fetal testicular testosterone production with a similar potency to DHP. And they found that uh, the IBP was even slightly more potent than the EP, uh, reducing the STAR and CYP11A gene expression levels. Paper was that? Hannes, Earl Grey. It would mean that this point of departure could be 5,000. Which is why in case two we use different point of departures. Also this study is not, cannot be used to derive a novel or a point of departure. It can be used to compare the relative potencies. So would that uh justify altering that point of departure there. Okay, so that's the point. So we originally said we were going to work through this exercise using our case three estimates for reference doses which turned into points of departures. We consider other cases, like other rationale for coming up with a value. Um, One of those where you really feel comfortable doing that is you that we have now too high or based upon the real the data that we've just looked at and what you summarized Holger? this is why in case two we decided to have a point of departure comparable to DEHP I feel comfortable or uncomfortable with this point of departure here but we have in case three here, with this uh, point of departures, a different approach. We base it on studies, on literature data, and we have to be aware that these 
are all studies from possibly different groups, different authors, different years, and different study designs. Okay, then let me let me cut to the chase straight away. So if we have a point of departure similar to DHP from a study, well, suggested in a study that's really not set up for deriving point of departures, mm -hmm. then you require a higher margin of safety of around 1,000 maybe you can, I don't know. But we are getting with that one into the gray zone here, although the exposures are low. Mm -hmm. So your point of departure becomes what? Oh, where, what's the, how does the value change? Is it reduced by a factor of 10? Well, if you, if you. 20, 100? To 5,000? Yeah. 50. It's a factor of 50, right? So factor of 50, so we're in, you're right, we're in the gray zone. Absolutely. Gray zone. <laughs> so to summarize, adversity, relevance to human, mm -hmm. satellite syndrome, and risk assessment gives borderline. So what do we do with that? I don't know. Quite a lot of criteria fulfilled. Uh, let me start it off. Is there anything uh, on this in this base of evidence that would lead us to argue it falls a little short of uh, proposing a permanent ban, so which would then consequently lead us to propose an interim ban? Is there anything? Well, there's a, quite a bit of discrepancy between what the point of departure is. So again, if that could be studied a little further to where you could really come down on a point of departure. That would make it a clearer picture. Just thing is interim. If if you had to make a decision now, you're leaning because it's in the gray area, but with the fact that there is uncertainty. But that some of the studies have been moving toward meeting the cri the criteria that Andreas does. It would be more toward interim plan. But you have to remember too, you have the human data, so with. I mean, if, if we kind of think about keeping the bar consistent as we go through these, mm -hmm. if with DEP we didn't have the animal data mm -hmm. and we had that same swan study and we were approaching a gray zone, with the IBP we have the same swan study, plus we have some animal data, plus, you know, we have the exposure data. So the, the, the bar is moving, I think, as we're going from chemical, from DEP to, in this case, DIBP. And that's why I'm more inclined. Because we have more information. Yeah. I, I didn't say that. Well, no, but what are you saying? Because <laughs> my feeling say is you're, something. You're, 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 Andreas and I, I think are on the same wavelength that we're <laughs> Thinking you're saying an interim ban. I would say either an interim ban or, or, or a ban. I mm. would want to review especially the tox data more, to have more on that. But I, I would say at a, at a minimum the, the interim ban, just given that wh where the bar was for DEP yeah. and that single human study and the lack really of animal studies, whereas here we have more but, but information. The, the difference between here is Holger and Chris's comments and Holger in terms of DEP, we're talking about low toxicity and every everywhere we're constantly coming up with that number. We're, we're uh, coming down with Chris's point was that we're talking about uncertainty with respect to what the point of departure is, with but the there is, yeah, with diabetes. So, so even though it's, you know, it, it's moving me more toward the, the interim ban and finalize it once you get a better point of departure. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely moved me in that direction too, okay. yeah. Plus, looking at enhanced data, we have to be aware that the <coughs> body burdens nearly tripled in the last eight years. The IBP? Yes. Okay. We have to assume that it's coming onto the market as a replacement for Diane BP. So the numbers show that exposures rose from 
geometric means of 2.54 to 7.22, and that's over all percentiles. That's in micrograms. Per As liter. a replacement of what for what fluoride? For dinbutyl phthalate. Dinb. Dinp. Dinp. Exactly. That's a process that already took place in Europe. So is the the one point nine here is is that reflecting the it's data. increase over time or no? No. I would assume that uh, data from today would be higher. <coughs> how did this So how did Europe handle this? I mean they replaced A with B and reach didn't reach into the issue? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. You're replacing one with another, and no testing had been done prior to the replacement? Europe? Now, in Europe, the IBP is labeled, but until 2009, we saw the process in, in the biomonitoring uh -huh. data the replacement process that took place because the NBP was labeled in 2004. 2004. I also want to make some comments about how we derived the, the no well. So we set the bar, which will be described in, in my section of the 30-page document about how we chose the study that defined the no well, which I've just given you the the study. But there are other studies, if, and as I think Holger just referred to, if, if you were to go to the HANA study and if you were to choose the effect that uh, they showed that CYP11A expression was decreased significantly at 100 milligrams per kilogram per day, then the NOL would be 50. Yeah. different. Yeah. But that study was not designed to develop a NOEL <laughs> by my criteria. Yeah. So meaning uh, if properly tested, we would with that endpoint probably get a NOEL that's even lower. Yes. Yeah. Had they done it. Yeah. Which pushes us Green. with the margin of uh, exposure consideration into the gray zone here. Yeah. So we have quite a lot of criteria fulfilled. Why? Uh, I mean, in my mind now, this is between interim ban and permanent somewhere, mm -hmm. if not. And yeah. and you know, we, we I could write that up as yeah. you know, yeah. if we if we set these standards for for yeah. choosing the study that's going to determine the well, this is close to it. What we're going to get if we go to other studies and use other criteria, this is what we're going to have, and now we're in a different mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. in terms of our recommendation. Mm -hmm. well, what do we feel? Do, do these criteria make sense? This seems, what, what, do you, what do you think? I think they're fruitful, no? Very fruitful. Well, I mean, if you, if you, if you believe that, you know, the, the, the rat phthalate syndrome starts with changes in gene expression and testosterone synthesis decrease and that then funnels down to all the other changes, then, you know, CYP11A is a very important uh, initial change and there's no reason why you can't select that to determine your NOEL. In terms of the, these as criteria, I, I'm happy with our discussion. I think we've made some nice sort of order. But I, the thing that I think we haven't really addressed yet is we haven't thought of them as a set. We've, we're thinking of them as the way we thought of them as a set is in terms of the hazard. But then go from this to hazard index, or do we try to accumulate something here? And Just well, I think we have to do both, and it's yes. not mutually exclusive. But we have to do this exercise here first then uh, uh, derive additional information, additional criteria from consideration of cumulative uh, exposure. 
And also, it also leans toward the idea of doing more complex mixture studies. If you're going to do this aggregation that you're suggesting, and I agree with, you know, it's it's better to look at the the groups in total when you're thinking about how you do doing regular. Yeah, it makes more sense because that's what we're going to be living with each day. So based on our criteria. I would propose to propose the IPP for a permanent ban. I, I would agree with that. Who would like to write that one up for our subsequent discussion? It's DIBP. P, yeah, the one we just discussed. The, the write-ups for, for the, I mean, they're going to contain different components, right? Exactly. So you'll so probably want a few lines or someone's going to have to go in human and study, exactly. a few lines on the yep. tox, yep. a few lines on the ex exposure to Something put it that, together. that we can all look at and then say that's, that's it or modify it. Um, at this stage, it can be pretty rough, yes, yes. but something... Yep. But I would recommend that every one of our reviews has the same elements so that we, we agree on the format, the template for this, and then we all use exactly the same template, even if in some cases it's, it's either the relevance might be assumed or it's known or uh, we may have some blanks here, but if we all use the same template, then we're not creating new words and new concepts from one chemical to another. I do have one issue, though. We're doing this right now. Total absence of information about the levels that lead to exposures in kids' toys, based upon chemical structure and based upon toxicology, based upon studies. But it's not addressing the fundamental question of the kids' toys again. We have to somewhere in that have to factor it in. I mean, it's, 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 it's the issue that we have to grapple with, although we can recommend, make recommendations about other agencies dealing with the total exposure issues. We still have this other burning issue that we will eventually fill in the gap, but I don't want to lose that thought at this point yeah. in time. But I'm, I'm just trying to get us one step closer no, to, I agree. to I agree. having recommendations we can modify these add to them well, the, the question I have is we say we're going to do a permanent ban based for what you know just for toys for the chemical itself I'm not sure where I'm again I'm, I'm a little bit in confusion about what you mean there. Well, well we can't we can't ignore the charge here that our remit you know we can't uh, pontificate about a general ban uh, of course it has to be in in care products and toys as no. defined by the act that's because we're making recommendations yeah. to CPSC yeah. and that's that that's the only thing I want us to remind ourselves mm -hmm. that we have to constantly go back to that throw back to that question so as we see as we see the levels mm -hmm. of that may be a qualitative statement these are bad effects you know the exposure may be very minor to children's toys but, yeah, but are CPS you going to put bad chemicals in children's toys but but CPSCs only can deal with factor X, Y, or Z, not A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I would suggest, again, trying to achieve consistency in what we're going to write down, that there would be six pieces to this. One, in addition to the name of the chemical, but nature of the adverse effects. Second would be the relevance to humans. Third would be the weight of evidence. Fourth would be risk to a risk consideration. Fifth would be the recommendation itself. And the sixth one would be would this recommendation affect exposure of children to phthalates, to this specific phthalate? So that we, we have that answer every time, even in today's discussion. We I wrote it down on the first one. But I don't have an answer to that on the last three. Well, 
I, I didn't ask myself or the rest of you that question. And that, that will come as you finish up the analyses, which are close to finishing up and getting to us. Because I think the main thing to get to us for um, this analysis eventually will be the differentiation either as percent of exposure or the aggregate of exposure that derived from KISS toys versus other routes and by route of entry too. It could be kids' toys by incidental ingestion. It could be done by uh, a direct ingestion yes. through sucking. It could be a whole host of issues. We have to figure out the, the body burden for the phthalates that are due to the kids' toys. But we have to be aware that probably also for the IPP there's a lack of data on the exposure side because the IPP, I think, has only been regularly measured as an isoform, not in a sum with NBP for a couple of years. So we, we have to be aware that probably okay. the data is very minimal. Well, that's something we have to talk about too. Yeah. Soldier, would you tackle the DIBP? Tackle it. I'll get your arms around it. Write up a paragraph. Thank you. I think we'll uh, break for today, and tomorrow we'll come back and, and tackle the remaining phthalates and phthalate substitutes. Yep. Thank you all. So tomorrow we're going to meet at 9. Mike, let's meet at 8.30 tomorrow. Okay, so we're going to meet at 8.30.